2015 comes around to have the chance to go to the Pan American Games with Argentina. And it was pretty much the same situation as 2011, honestly. It hadn't been much progress in any way. Um, between then and 2015, um, they had won the um, Ole Sur Games, which is like a smaller version of the Pan American Games. So it's like the southern countries of South America play um, sort of like a mini Olympic sort of I guess it'd be kind of like the Commonwealth Games right like that extent and uh yeah I remember like we lost our three matches we tied one and lost the other no sorry no that's where they actually won gold they won the gold they beat Brazil to go to the final beat Chile actually in penalties <laughs> and uh it was huge like the girls were so excited and I hadn't won a like a gold in any South American championship since 2006 when Argentina beat Brazil in the final of the Copa America and they come back and they're hoping to like to make some progress that they're going to see some response from AFA which was the like our our football federation and nothing changed it was the same um getting like a stipend I think it was uh 100 pistols a day which is like oh I don't know like nothing like ten dollars a day pretty much um for playing yeah. and if they were getting paid and then um when we went to the pan american games in 2015 we had no no friendlies leading up to that and we were facing i think in our group we had trinidad and tobago which was more or less in the same position as we were so we ended up we draw we drew them and then we were we had to face off with colombia and mexico which were just coming off the world cup and they both had really good world cups that year <laughs> And yeah, we got hammered. We we lost, I think, three nil, two nil against um, Mexico and and Colombia. And I remember after the after we'd lost, we had to stay an extra two weeks because our federation didn't want to pay for our tickets to come back because they'd taken they received the tickets from like the the Olympic Committee and it was whenever they had gotten our flights, which was for the very end of the Pan American Games, was when oh, we were yeah. going to go back. So we were there just like sitting around seeing one by one as some of the teams left because they had lost and like, we're still there. And the Brazilians like, what are you still doing here? Like, well, they won't send us home. Oh my God. We were in Toronto in Canada. And um, no, we had a meeting with like the, the president of, of women's football of the association and basically said like, until you guys start winning, we can't give you anything. Like you can't ask for anything. But, but what the girls were asking for was, um, more continuity like matches um, between like during the World Cup cycle as well because otherwise we knew that after we'd lost that that tournament in 2015 our next tournament wasn't going to be until 2018 with the Copa America mm. and lo and behold we lose that game we we not we get knocked out of the Pan American Games and we didn't even have a coaching staff until 2017 for the women's national team Oh my God. So this is the, this is a setup for what we're coming into um, yeah. trying to think about qualifying for a world cup in you know, in a zone where we had to compete with, with countries like with Chile, it's not necessarily the best. Uh, they don't have the most support in South America, but their federation had been pushing at least and the girls had been playing um, their team had been playing at least a few international friendlies they've been traveling to europe i think they came to australia they played two friendlies here um they they've been pushing for world cup qualification and they've been working towards it and they've had the support of their federation and playing against a country like colombia which has put together a professional league and playing against brazil which who you know is gonna gonna win the copa pretty much it's just trying to find that get that second or third spot to have a chance at qualifying and so we finally start training again together as a as a national team at, at the end of 2017 but they weren't even paying stipends then so um the girls decided to go on strike which is the first time they'd ever like organized to do anything in terms of um a reaction to mistreatment it's kind of just been well this feeling that i'd rather just deal with the situation and, and keep going because i know that if like i speak up I probably won't continue, won't have the opportunity to continue to play. It's just easier sometimes for the club or for the federation just to say, "Look, you're too much of an issue. I just kick you off and not not call you back up." And um, 
bring someone else in who's not going to be not going to make noise but this was the first time we were able to actually like unify unite as a team and and take action and um there really wasn't a clear response from AFA at that point it was kind of well we'll see what we can do because AFA was also in this period of transition where um Grandona which is who was this long-standing president of the federation between 1978 and until he died in 2015 I think 2014 so basically they're in shambles as well. So it's just kind of, you never know, like you, you would ask or talk to the president of, of women's football who had, wasn't the same one we'd talked to before. There had been a change there, but basically everything would get lost in translation. Like nothing that we were fighting for was able to be accomplished. But February of 2018 comes around and World Cup qualifying starts in April. And it's just a two week, or almost a month long tournament and that's it that's your shot at qualifying for the world cup for the olympic games for the pan american games and then you know if it doesn't go well the same thing could happen where we're not having matches until you know four years from then so um there's a lot of, a lot at stake so pretty much even after the the strike nothing really was determined the girls were like well whatever uh we're gonna it's it's if we don't go back, we're the ones losing out because we won't have any chance of, of qualifying for the World Cup in that case. So we go back to training um, like mid-February, two weeks before the Copa America. We finally are all together as a team because we had players that were in Europe who came back over to, to Argentina to prepare. And yeah, pretty we go into to Copa America with pretty much two weeks to team together together as a team and um i think we ended up shocking a lot of a lot of teams we make it through the group stage which is which is hard because it's uh two groups of five teams and uh we were in the same group as brazil venezuela um i think ecuador which is a team that you can never underestimate um oh, i don't remember if we had i think it was bolivia yeah, and then us. That makes sense. That's five. And we knew that the, the Brazil was a loss, like, or we could maybe eke out a draw against them. That would be great. But that Venezuela was another country that had been pushing and actually investing quite a bit in their national team in comparison to previous years. Um, they, and then you also had Ecuador there, which is going to make it make our lives difficult. But we're able to get through the group stage. Um, and Throughout this whole tournament, we've been in conversations like, I don't know, late night where we'd gather either first amongst ourselves and say, look, what do we want to do? How do we want to move on from here? Because we had players at that point who were playing um, in some, some of the best leagues in the world, one who was in the NWSL, another player who was playing in, the, in China, um, another player who had, other players who had played in, in Brazil for some of the top teams, another one who was playing in Spain. So they'd experience something different. They're like, something's wrong here. Like, there's no way we should be playing for a national team and being in worse conditions than you would be with a club team. And so as a team, we kind of decided, well, are we willing to risk our personal gains or our personal opportunities to be on the national team and speak out and, and make change? And so um, after the group stage, we decided to – to do something before our match against Colombia. And so we decided to, like when they were taking the official team photo, um, to put our one hand behind our ear um, as an entire team. And the whole time the people from Colombia were just yelling at us like, it's only supposed to be the starting 11. You guys are gonna get fined. And we're like, screw it. And we all went, <laughs> we took the picture and it went viral in Argentina. and. Um, I've seen the photo. Started having a lot. You, you've seen it? Yeah. yeah. I think it's it's one of my favorite. It was one of my favorite moments, and it was kind of a turning point, I think. Um, and from there, don't so I want to say that just from that moment we started having more support. I think it was a combination of the photo and then uh, having the opportunity to qualify for the World Cup, and our federation pre president also like kind of opening up to the idea that investing in women's football could be beneficial for his, 
for his administration as well. It's kind of become his, like one of his political uh, strong points, I guess. Like when he's, he was up for re-election, I think this past year. And was one of the things that he campaigned on was his support for women's football. So we did start to see some changes. We had some, some friendlies leading up to, we had to play a playoff against Panama in, uh, was it in November of 2018 to be able to qualify for the, for France. And um, we had a, like one trip where we were to play friendlies against some universities in the U S and then against Puerto Rico. Um, and then they organized a couple more friendly, like once we'd qualified, then they're like, Oh, we need to get our stuff together. Like we have to get some international friendlies or some matches in before the world cup. Um, and so we started to see some changes, but it's, it's still, still a struggle. Um, but the, like I said, this past year has been pretty, pretty crazy because having come from like this permanent, like stagnant levels of, of nothing or being ignored and, and neglected to finally, you know, qualifying for a world cup. Um, when we played that playoff match, we played in front of a packed stadium. There were 10,000 people and, and it sold out within the first, you know, 24 hours, the tickets were available online. They were free, but they, they were completely gone within 24 hours, which I think shocked everybody. I don't think that even we thought that it was going to be like, there was going to be that much demand to come see us play. And I think it was also in the context of a really strong women's movement in Argentina as well. And over the past few years, uh, there's been a huge movement against uh, domestic violence, particularly. And uh, more recently, uh, there's been a movement to legalize abortion. And so I think football kind of entered into that because it was kind of that last unconquered sphere in Argentina that this is like was still seen as just a man's air, a man's space. And so like, I think for a lot of feminists as well, it was kind of like, oh, well, these girls kind of represent a, a bigger struggle as well. So I think that's kind of something else that pushed um, the media, especially getting behind us and, and starting to publish about like what was going on. Like why, why, why doesn't the national team have any coverage? Why don't they have support? Why are they earning like $6 a day? Like, this is crazy. And um, I think that, like a combination of the media pressure and um, our own achievements were a big part of pushing towards the announcement of a pro the first professional league in Argentina in March of 2019. So a lot of changes in a really short period of time, but I think it was kind of, um, it's something that I'm working on kind of trying to synthesize or discuss um, in my PhD dissertation, which is on exactly all of these issues. Um, trying to understand like the the process that happened over these past few years, but it's been amazing to be a part of and really uh, kind of leaves you with an optimistic feeling because you're starting to see more and more young girls finally have idols to look up to that aren't male players and starting to see, oh, well, there's actually, I have opportunities to play after like more than just playing on the street with my brothers and my cousins or playing with my friends. Like I can, I can strive to play in the first division, the Argentine first division. I can strive to be on the national team. I want to play like Bon Segundo. I want to play like Steffi Vanini. I want to play like Agus Barroso um, or Vanina Correa, the other goalkeeper. And uh, that was something that never existed before. Like it's, it's crazy, but I have um, Florencia Bon Segundo was the, the player who scored the two goals against uh, Scotland in Thai. <laughs> At being that was down a great three, game. you know, it's crazy. Um, what a game! But I'm telling, like, this is crazy. If you think about how she got there, this is a girl that, if it hadn't been for like a stroke of fate, like she, who knows where she would be right now? We would never have Lord Von Segunda. We would never have a player like that with the heart that she has. Like, she, she comes from a tiny town in a province called Cordoba in Argentina, and she grew up playing with boys and when she turned 13, they were no longer allowed her to play in the league because that was like the cutoff for when girls were no longer to continue, like allowed to keep playing with boys. So she was without a team for until she was 15. So she was just playing in the streets with her brothers pretty much. 
Um, and then a friend comes up and says, hey, you want to join? There's a women's team that's getting put together. He's like, you want to join? She's like, sure. So she played for a week pretty much with this team from this tiny town in Cordoba, um, playing with girls who were twice or 30 <laughs> twice or almost three times her age. Some of them were playing mother and daughter on the same team. It was completely amateur, just like, you know, finish playing on the weekend and grab a beer together. That was it. And that's like Sunday league sort of stuff. Yeah, that, that's pretty much like what women's football has been for a long time in Argentina. It's just like, we don't have any, they didn't have any official spaces to play, but it was like, well, we'll get together and we'll play anyway. We'll organize our own league and we'll have fun with it. And so that was like where she was playing as a 15 year old. And like a couple of weeks after she joined that team, they're like, oh, well, we have this tournament in, at the, in Cordoba, at the, at the capital city of Cordoba, where uh, we're going to be playing against other teams from the province. And she's like, and they're like, want to come? Sure, she says. So she goes and she ends up, uh, she ends up seeing that there's this, like these girls that are getting warmed up on the side and they're very professional. They're like, actually have a, a legitimate, legitimate warm-up. They, they're organized. They see, she's seen a goalkeeper. She's watching the goalkeepers warm up and she sees how the goalkeeper actually dives with a, like a good technique for the first time. She's like, what is this? And then they're like, oh yeah, this is the national team. Like they're coming to recruit players here actually. And so um, she has a great tournament, gets picked for like the all-star team, but has to play against the national team. They get hammered, but I think she scores a goal. And so they're like, well, do you want to come to one of the for, for a trial? And like her parents say, yes, obviously they, they let her go. And so she has like a, the way that they usually train, they still continue to do so. You train Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with the national team. And so the players from other provinces will take a bus the night before if you live far away. So Cordoba, she like, I think she had about a 12 hour bus ride from her city. Oh my God. <laughs> Buenos Aires. So she went overnight, uh, arrived uh, Tuesday morning, got to the hotel, checked in or whatever, there, where the girls from the provinces were staying. And I think she said she ended up being able to train only two days because the first day at, at uh, AFA, they only do like your medical stuff in order to be able to make sure that you're okay to play. So she had Wednesday and Thursday to train. And um, she said she played pretty well. And at the end of the week, she understood that they, she had to come back uh, the next week. So she on the weekend she tells her dad oh dad you have to buy me another bus ticket because I have to go back to Buenos Aires for next week uh, they said we're supposed to go go train and so the next week she shows up at the hotel gives her last name and the uh, the receptionist goes well sorry I, you're not on the list but it's all right we'll find your room anyway so she's like all right that's weird didn't really think much of it she gets to the the national team like the complex where like we have our training facilities and um runs into the goalkeeper coach and he's like bon segundo what are you doing here she was like what do you mean what am i doing here and he's like no but at the end of last practice like the coach said that he was going to call whoever needed to come over the weekend did you get a call no it's like oh screw it you're already here train with us and so she ended up training. She played, they played in a couple of friendlies. She killed it. She scored a couple of goals. And then from there, she ended up staying on the youth national team. Like she would play with the U17s, the U20s, and the full team and never looked back. And now she's playing for Valencia in Spain, this girl from this tiny town in Cordoba. And you say, if that, things hadn't happened that way, I'm like, it's, it's crazy. Like, that they is had insane. Their... What I a love story, that story, dude. I love that story. It's like... But it's sad. It's like, it, it's a great story. But at the same time, you're like, it shouldn't have to be a great story. She should have had the opportunities that the, bo the boys had because there are guys from her, her town that have gone on to play in the pros and gone on to play in Europe. But, sure. you know, it's, it's just like the lack of opportunities and this like, I don't know. She had to get quite lucky to get through the barriers that were in her way to get to the national team. Like she didn't even know there was a national team. Like she yeah, right. didn't have anything to aspire to because she didn't even know it existed. But now, like, I think what's happened now is that that those kind of stories, I hope will become more and more rare where it's not like, I didn't know it existed. It's like, no, I, I like, she's my idol. Like I'm looking, I want to be like her. I want to get to that point as well. 
something like what happened in the U.S. after the 99 World Cup, where you've had generations of players who have been inspired because of that 99 team. I'll include myself in that. And because we had girls and women to look up to. And now I think that in Argentina, we didn't win a World Cup, but I think we turned a lot of heads. We surprised a lot of people um, with the results we were able to achieve. And even I think we all were recognized, recognized as well that just getting to the World Cup for us was, was a major achievement considering the circumstances. And yeah, I don't know. I think that's, I get really excited because it's, it's something that um, has surprised me at, like in a good way, because if you had asked me, I don't know, in 2018, when do you think football will be professional in Argentina? And I'll say when pigs fly, like probably if we're lucky in 10 years. And then the league is, has a lot to continue to work on, but the fact that there are players with professional contracts in Argentina for the first time is a huge, huge step forward. So I think there's a long way to go, but things are, things are looking up. And I think that also the fact that girl, the players are becoming more and more conscious of their rights as players, I think it's going to make it harder for clubs and even for the association to go back to the way things were. And I think that's, that's a big thing as well. I think um, this World Cup has really shown a lot of people the importance of women's football and how big and how great it can be. And I think with that, you know, you have countries or you have places like Europe that are now taking it a lot more seriously than maybe they have in the past. And, you know, their leagues are only just going to get better and better. And I think with that, you know, South America is obviously, you know, a football powerhouse and, you know, you would hope that 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 would, you know, translate and that women's football would grow from there, you know, within those countries. And obviously, like, you know, Chile, they qualified for the first time for the World Cup, um, which was insane. And then you have their goalkeeper, Christian Endler, who plays for PSG and she's playing the Champions League this weekend. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's incredible. And, you know, I got to go watch Chile play when they were here. Um, I've seen them play three times, which is more than I can say I've ever seen the men's team play, which which is, I guess, what I love about the Women's League is that, you know, I'm able to, to watch, you know, my country play in a country that I live in.